uh, welcome to our podcast. It accompanies the uh, lecture series, The History and Context of Journalism at uh, Winchester University. My name is Brian Thornton. I'm joined by Chris Harry, who gave the lecture, and by Andrew and Jack, who are students, who are uh, uh, first-year journalism students at Winchester University. Uh, the lecture today was about uh, Adam Smith. Uh, he was an 18th century philosopher, uh, m believed to be the founder of uh, economics. Chris, uh, if I could start with you, what was his purpose in writing The Wealth of Nations? It's uh, an attempt at the scientific analysis of society, very much in Newtonian terms, to see whether we can discover uh, laws of human behaviour um, akin, by metaphor if nothing else, to the, the types of uh, laws of natural phenomena that Newton and others have dis uh, discovered at that time. Um, so it's written in the style of a, uh, a scientific document, amassing data, trying to deduce uh, themes from it. And, and what it addresses, the, the main question is, you know, simply why is one country richer than another? And, and w one interesting thing about it for today is a lot of the book concerns China. At that point, China had gone into a period of relative economic stagnation. It fell well behind Europe to the point that it's, it's virtually colonised, never was quite colonised, but it's dominated by Portugal, uh, by, by uh, the British uh, and, and Europeans generally. So why had this great historic centre of world civilization uh, become so enfeebled economically? And uh, he's got some uh, interesting speculation on that in the book. Um, one of the areas that I found very interesting about Smith was his idea of the hidden hand of the market. Could, could you explain what he meant by that? Well, this is, this is central. Uh, the, the law that he discovers is, is, is this idea of the hidden hand, that if each person pursues their own enlightened self-interest um, to maximise their own utility, to amass the most amount of wealth for themselves, this seems on the face of it to be a very selfish act. But he says that uh, through the law of unintended consequences, uh, this, by and large, that kind of selfish activity will promote uh, the good of everybody. And he's quite specific how this happens. It happens because that approach, um, so long as it's not constrained in any way by the government, will promote the division of labour, or what he calls skill, uh, which will increase economic efficiency as people seek to produce goods for the lowest possible price and sell them for the maximum possible price. Um, so the hidden hand of the market is something akin to a, a natural law uh, which he believes applies everywhere. It does apply in China. It applies uh, from what he knew about Holland, uh, Scandinavia, England and Ireland. And, it, and where, the hin where the hidden hand of the market is allowed to act without constraint, um, as he sees it, you get rapid growth in wealth. Uh, and, and that's really pretty much the nub of the book. Um, it appears to me that Smith was very much a product of his time. He, he, um, a lot of the events, the historical events that were happening in his lifetime um, influenced his work and sort of defined his thinking. Uh, can you sort of outline some of those, um, especially when he, in terms of uh, Scottish history? That's right. He, he was Scottish, and he's known as a, a figure in the Scottish Enlightenment. We discussed in this lecture series previously what you might call the French Enlightenment, people like... Descartes and so on. This is the Scottish Enlightenment. It has a very different character. Uh, these people are empiricists. They believe themselves to be scientists. Famously, Smith was a professor of philosophy and moral philosophy at uh, Glasgow University at the same time as James Watt, the uh, inventor of the steam engine. So um, he, he, uh, what's happening at that time is Scotland is undergoing an economic transformation because of its recent union with uh, England. It happens in the Act of Union, 1707. And this creates a kind of common market, that's the, the old word for the EU, whereby suddenly the number of opportunities that the Scottish in particular have to trade uh, increases massively because it gives them access to London so they can sell their labour, their goods and their services to England, to London. But beyond that, they can sell it to the English Empire, as it was, or the English colonies in North America. The Scottish didn't have their own colonies. They tried to set one up 
in Darien in Panama, but it failed. So now suddenly they've got this cheap labour in Scotland because this is the period when people are, the clan system of the Highlands is being destroyed. People are migrating to uh, Glasgow and Edinburgh, the Lowlands. Um, they form a pool of very cheap labour who can be uh, exploited, to, to, to use that word in, in its non pejorative uh, sense, to create cheap goods and services that can be sold throughout the British Empire. Um, if I can bring in Jack at this point. Uh, Jack, what was your, uh, your take on Adam Smith? I think that whenever, any, whenever anyone is exploited, it isn't beneficiary to the economy as a whole. To take, for instance, um, Adam Smith's theory of free market capitalism in comparison with the Model T Ford factories in America... He said that um, individualize well um, uh, skills, giving everyone a different skill, yeah. would benefit everyone. Whereas in reality, it was very low wages, and people were very harshly treated. Yeah, well, that is a, a common critique of Adam Smith and uh, and his view is that people end up um, having a um, a very alienated uh, existence. It's a, it's a word we use in connection with Rousseau. Previously, it comes back with. Uh, Hegel and Marx, that uh, in, in his famous example of the pin factory, it, it, the pins that are produced might not be very cheap because they, they might have been previously made in a kind of cottage industry, but the whole family could make a few pins and then go for a walk and, and, and they had kind of satisfaction that I make really good pins. Um, but now they're an atomized person on a production line and their job is just to measure the point of the pin or something and it's very boring, it's very repetitive, it's very soul destroying. Um, and he was aware of that, uh, and, uh, but he said, well, you know, that's life. You know, it's, it's like cursing the law of gravity. If you try and stop division of labour, all you will produce is misery in a kind of different form. So in that sense, he, he's a rather pessimistic f thinker. Generally speaking, he's optimistic, though, because he, he thinks that, well, then people will jack it in in the pin, pin factory. They won't do it. They'll go off and, and do something uh, more fulfilling. Um, so, yeah, that's a common critique of it and the kind of harshness of the factory system that we saw in the 19th century that was built up uh, explicitly on the principles of free trade. Adam Smith is a very important thinker in framing actual government policy in terms of the repeal of the Corn Laws and the promotion of free trade. It did create a kind of hell on earth, <clears throat> really, for 100 years in the industrial towns of, of, of England, the north of England, and, and throughout the world. Um, and, of course, still today, I mean, you know, jobs are broken down to the point where somebody uh, in, in the food production line has absolutely no idea where this stuff has come from or where it's going. They just do this thing and they're bored out of their mind. They are low paid. Uh, it's de-skilled. They can easily be replaced. So um, it, it's a good point, and he's, he's kind of um, in two minds about it, I would say. Um, he's a very controversial figure. I mean, he's, he moves in and out of fashion um, over time. Uh, currently, how does he stand? He's in the doghouse at the moment. He was unbelievable. First of all, he was very unfashionable in the 1930s. So Bertrand Russell, for example, in his book, doesn't even mention him. I was amazed to find not one line about uh, Adam Smith. Why? Because the, the 20s and 30s was the era of mass unemployment. Now, one of the consequences of the hidden hand of the market uh, and of what's called classical economics generally is that unemployment is impossible. It's an, it, it's an affront to nature like levitation or hovering. You know, it's against the law of gravity. You could have temporary unemployment as people move out of the pin factory because nobody wants pins anymore into whatever it is doing next.